Understand so we can pray. Not another car. Not another pair of shoes. Bless your name, Lord Jesus. We thank you. But I want more of you, Lord. We give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory, Father God, for waking us up this morning. We thank you for who you are and all the wonderful things that you're doing, Father God. Just ask and pray, Father God, in the name of Jesus, that as we enter into this day, March 30th, 2013, Father God, that you keep us mindful of who you are in our lives, Father God, that, and the purpose that, that we need you, Father God. We thank you, Father God, for an opportunity, Lord Jesus, to come before you, Father God. No one forced us, Father God. We, we desire to be with you. We desire to walk with you, Father God. Most of all, we desire to know you. We thank you for an opportunity, Father God, in the name of Jesus, to be a, among the land of the living, Father God. Somebody tried to wake up this morning and couldn't because their time was up here on earth, Father God. In the name of Jesus. Someone last night, Father God, may have fell in danger, Father God, but you kept us safe, Father God, in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for that. We pause and thank you and give you thanks for that right now in the name of Jesus, Father God. We thank you, Father God, that you have us in our right minds, Father God, that we're not somewhere knocking our head up against a wall because we don't have no common sense. We thank you, Father God, in the name of Jesus for the in the name of Jesus for the, the fact that we can control our hands, our eyes, our ears, our legs, our feet, Lord Jesus. We take this not for granted, Father God. The Bible is written that in everything that we should give thanks for, this is the will of God concerning us, Father God. We thank and praise you, Father God, that you desire to use us to glorify yourself through us, Father God. We thank you that you're preserving those, Father God, that are outside the ark of safety right now, Lord Jesus. We pray a shield of protection continually around them. We pray for those that are sick and shut in, Father God. We pray for those in the name of Jesus who need you right now. Send forth your ministry and angels. As we go forth and minister on this miracle march, Father God, we just ask and pray, Father God, that your word come through with clarity and understanding, and that the words of my mouth and the med meditation in my heart be pleasing in your sight. Oh God, in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Turning your Bibles to John chapter 2. John chapter 2, and we'll be, like I said before, previously, we're still in Miracle March, and we're still talking about miracles. If you've been following along, if not, you can uh, go back into Ustream or YouTube and see some of the things we've been talking about concerning Miracle March. This is officially our fourth teaching and preaching on Miracle March concerning you getting your miracle. And me too. I'd be the first person in the line, probably elbowing old people and pushing people out the way, if there was a line for me to receive miracles, because I need a miracle just as bad as I've been preaching about miracles. And I've learned so much and have gathered so much and just simply hearing from the word of God concerning how we are to receive a miracle, which brings us to our title for today's subject, our title and subtitle. Our first title that God gave me is New Wine Passover Miracle. New Wine Passover Miracle. That's going to be concerning the story we're going to talk about and uh, the subtitle that God gave me, I rarely get subtitles, but the subtitle God gave me was Follow the Instructions for Your Miracle. Follow the Instructions for Your Miracle. Like I said, we in our ministry have been talking about miracles in March that we call Miracle March. The world has March Madness, but if you're in the body of Jesus Christ and if you're not playing college basketball, you, that you just a partaker of this. You're just watching it. But uh, miracles is something that we all can partake in. And God gave me this word before March came. And he said, I want you to talk about Miracle March and to help people understand that they can receive their miracle. And I said before that you don't necessarily have to receive your miracle in March, but you need to have an understanding. We in the body of Christ and preachers, we preach the gospel. We, we plant the word. It's up for you to hear and take the word and hide it in your heart that you might not sin against you and live and, and eat off that word. So like I said, this is our fourth teaching on Miracle March. And I'm going to do a little quick summary so that we, it will bring us right to where we are now. And on 3-9-13, March the 9th, 13, we talked about the miracle Jesus performed in Matthew 8, 5-13 with the centurion soldier where the centurion soldier came beseeching the Lord Jesus Christ on behalf of his servant. 
And the centurion soldier, the point that God had me drive on that particular time is that this was a, a Roman soldier. This guy did not go to church. He did not pay tithes. He had nothing to do with the church organization or the structure of the church. He wasn't a member. He didn't listen to gospel music. He was just somebody who heard about Jesus Christ and decided to believe in Jesus Christ. And so he came beseeching Jesus Christ, and Jesus heard his petition, and he even told Jesus, said, I don't need you. I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only. And I shared with people back on the 9th that that's what we're doing. I'm speaking the word only. So that is one way that God will help you receive your miracle. And I'm going to get into the definition of miracle. I hear the Lord saying some people don't even understand. One quick definition is a miracle is an extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention on human affairs. An extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs. It's something that only God can do. That's what a miracle is. So this centurion soldier cried out, beseeching Jesus, says, look, speak the word only, my servant will be healed. So on 3, 16, 13, we talked about the miracles Jesus performed in Matthew 9, 18 through 26, where he was asked by Jairus, uh, uh, who was a man who went to church. Now, first we did with the centurion soldier who didn't go to church. Now we're dealing with a man who goes to church. So this man came to Jesus worshiping him. So the, the, the unbeliever came beseeching Jesus, which means to fervently get him. Like, I need your help. I need your help. So not, not, with, not with doubt, but fervently seeking Jesus. That was the centurion soldier. So Jairus, a person who attended the temple, who knew God, that's who we are, believers. You know God. One way you can approach Jesus concerning your miracle is you come worshiping Jesus. And he came to Jesus and said, my daughter is dead. But I know if you come and lay your hands on her, she can live. He activated his faith by saying that, by worshiping, coming to Jesus. He, he respected who Jesus was, and he came worshiping him, and he asked him, if you come and lay hands, my daughter will live. And that's exactly how he came. Now, on Jesus' way to Jairus' house, a woman pressed through the crowd. She saw Jesus like, hold on. That's Jesus. I, I had an issue of blood for 12 long years. This is my opportunity to get my miracle. So she seized her opportunity and pressed through the crowd and grabbed the seat seat. That was the hem of his garment. It's called a zit zit. T-Z-I-T-Z-I. -Z 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 probably said it better than me. And she grabbed that. And she was like, if I grab that T Z, I will be made whole. So that's how she got her miracle. So on his way to going to Jairus' house, she got her miracle. So the centurion guard came beseeching. The Jairus came worshiping. And this woman came impressed. And we talked about that on 3.16.9. And last week, 3.23.13, we talked about blind man Bartimaeus. We talked about how a blind man Bartimaeus couldn't see nothing. And he always set himself by the highway. He wanted to put himself in a position where he can catch people going past begging for money. Now, like I said, he didn't ask to be put in the alley or on the side nowhere. He said, like, put me in a position where people got to go past me. But one day he, when he was put in his position to receive money with his hand out, he heard, heard all this noise going on. And they're like, what's going on? He's like, that's Jesus of Nazareth coming through. And he started crying out. He's in a position to receive money, but he said, oh, that's an opportunity for me to get my sight. That's what we need to understand. I spoke on that last week. That we need to understand. I don't care if we somewhere in the gym or we somewhere at the store, when you recognize the spirit of the living God, that's an opportunity for you to cry out and come up. And we spoke on that last week. So that brings us to where we are this week. Once again, the centurion officer beseeched Jesus. The woman with the issue pressed. Uh, Jairus, is, he, he worshiped, and the blind man cried out. Which brings us to this week, our final story dealing with miracles in John 2.1. And like I said, the subtitle that I have, the first title is New Wine for the Passover Miracle. And then this, the, the subtitle is Follow the Instructions for Your Miracle. Follow the Instructions for Your Miracle. And if you got your Bible, we're going to start in uh, chapter 2, verse 1. It says, On the third day, there was a marriage of Canaan and Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Verse 3 and when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto them, unto him, excuse me, they have no wine. Verse 4, Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Verse 5, his mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Verse 6, and there were set six water pots of stone after the manner of purifying the Jews, containing two or three first skins apiece. Verse 7, Jesus said unto them, 
fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. Verse 8, And he said unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. Verse 9, When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water, and was made wine, he knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom. Verse 10, And said unto him, Every man at the beginning of do have set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine unto now. Verse 11, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed on him. We're going to stop right there, and as I always do, we're going to pull our points and that's like when you read the Bible, walk, I tell people all the time, we teach three things in our ministry. It's observation, interpretation, and application. This is how you study the Bible. This is how you hear from a preacher to, uh, to, to effectively use the Bible in your life. Observation means what does the text say? You're just basically observing what the text says. Interpretation, what is the Spirit saying to me concerning the text? There will be things that will stick out in the text to me that won't, might not necessarily stick out to a king or to Devin. There are things that stick out, and you, they're sticking out because your spirit is bearing witness to what that word is saying. So that's interpretation. What, is it, what does God interpret? What's this word? Got? And then finally, last but not least, is application. How, does the word, how do I apply this word to my life so that I can get something out of it? Ain't nobody going to spend no hours practicing or working out without wanting some results. When we observe the word and we interpret the word, we need to apply the word to get some results. So in verse 5 it says, And his, his mother said unto the servants, Whatsoever he said to do it, do it. So that's the first set of instructions. Remember, we're talking about uh, following instructions to receive your miracle. God will always give you instructions to receive your miracle. Think about it. Everything you've done in life was based off instructions. From the minute you was a rug rat crawling on your knees till you could understand your, your parents, they started giving you instructions. Come here, sit down, shut up, stand up, give me that, grab me that. You've been getting instructions your whole life. And what God's really been trying to teach you to do is hear from him to receive instructions concerning supernatural things, concerning your miracle. But the Bible says this, he that have an ear to hear, let him hear what who the spirit is saying to the church. You know, and God's going to use prophets, God's going to use men, God may even use me. To give you instructions concerning a miracle. But here's the important part. You need to follow the instructions to receive your miracle. You can't just willy-nilly do what you want to do. You can't ad-lib. There's been so many times God has told me specifically, specifically people, that I, I ain't even understand. Like, God, why you have me tell him to do that like that? He's like, watch, I'm going to show you. And then when they don't do it exactly right, and then something happened, I was like, hey, man, I thought I told you. Yeah, but it was quicker doing it this way. Those wasn't the instructions. You'd be amazed how many things don't work in our life when we don't follow the instructions. You would. When you look back on it and you humble yourself and you quit being mad and all huffy and puffy, I don't understand why I got to do it that way. Well, you don't have to understand. Because once again, in this particular setting, we're talking about miracles. You know, a lot of times, I'm going to use basketball for an example like I always do. Everybody seems to like it. Uh, uh, the, you don't understand why the coach is calling that play. But he sees something that you don't see because you're in the game. He's outside the game calling the game. And he may see something that you don't see. Well, I don't understand why we would do that. You don't have to understand. That's how God is with us. God, he sits high and looks low. There are instructions he may give me for you that you don't necessarily understand. But I always, I always say understanding is not a prerequisite to obedience. The Bible says to obey it's better to obey than sacrifice, to hearken than the fat of rounds. What that means is better to obey than give. It is better to listen than the fat of rams. Well, I gave tithes, I gave offerings, I show up. No, it's better to obey. It's good you do all those things, but if you don't obey and hearken, you, you can't follow instructions. Instructions are more important than, than almost everything you're going to do. Because if you don't follow the instructions, you're never going to get to the place to where you can receive what God has for you. So verse 5 says, do what his mother said unto the servants, whatsoever he said unto you, do it. In verse 7, it says, Jesus said unto them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. Now what sticks out in that? Fill them up to the brim. They couldn't fill them up that far away from the brim or a little bit. That's why I know God, the God we serve is a specific 
and he's a God of order. He said, fill them to the brim. He ain't say leave no room for nothing. Fill them to the brim. The Bible says, I hear the scripture in my heart coming up. It says, my cup runneth over. You know, from my belly shall flow. God ain't going to never leave you half baked, half cooked. He ain't going to never have you in a position where I'm going to get your car, but ain't going to engine in it. What you, what you, Fred Funstone? You going to be in that bad boy with your feet? That's why I know it's God. The Bible says God will not bless you and add sorrow with it. He added no sorrow. There is no sorrow. God ain't going to give you something, and it's going to be lacking something. God didn't give it to you. That's why it's so important for us to follow the instructions. And, and I talk about baking cakes all the time. You know, I don't bake cakes, but I know what a cake's supposed to taste like. If you don't follow the instructions and put in the cake where it's supposed to be in there, now cake's been being baked for how many years? Hundreds and hundreds of years we've been baking cakes. Well, I felt like it tastes better if it just had a little bit more of this in there. Well, that cake is horrible. Why would you think that? You know, my grandmother, before she passed, she used to make these biscuits. And don't nobody in my whole family know how to make them biscuits. I'm mad. Rolls. Rolls of biscuits. Something like that. They either rolls of biscuits. I don't know the biscuits, let's say, in front of me. But either way it goes, when she made them bad boys, it was on the crack. And me and my cousin be outside playing. What's the, oh, man, it's on. <laughs> I don't know if it was a special family ingredient, but she made them. And, and people done tried. And it take two. Oh, no, no, uh-uh, uh-uh. You messed up. No, that ain't it. <laughs> next. Who next in line trying to do but they was, they was, they had, they, I, it was something she did, and I don't know if she did or didn't share, but the bottom line is I ain't had no biscuits like Grandma used to make, and that's the way the instructions are. So he said, fill it up to the brim, verse 8, and says, and he said unto them, draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. What is he doing? He is giving them instructions for this miracle. One thing I like about this miracle versus the other miracles is that it involved a group of people. The other miracles was individuals, the centurion officer concerning his servant. That's one person. Uh, going to see Jairus' daughter, he ran into the one with the issue of blood. That's one person. And then Jairus' daughter is one person. And Jairus. And then, you know, blind man Bartimaeus. Says, this, this, this one involves the instructions for a lot of people. So I believe in my heart there are times where God will tell people in a congregation, in order for that congregation to go, go, go debt free, or for God to miraculously do stuff with somebody that ain't never been done before as a group, he will give instructions. That's why it's so important for the whole group to follow the instructions of God. Everybody, the Bible talks specifically of things happening when they was on one accord. And I use, for example, all the time dealing with the enemy is that we are like spiritual soldiers, but we're in a tug of war battle. And ain't nothing worse than if you ever been to, to a real tug of war, we used to do this in high school. I don't know, I guess they don't do it no more, kids. They all out of shape and whatnot. But back in the day, we used to play tug of war. And we put the big dude on the end for the anchor. And a lot of times, uh, I could tell when somebody wasn't pulling. We'd be pulling and almost, I mean, this is like, it was a big deal when I was growing up. And we used to do it against the faculty, you know, against different grades. You know, you pick out 12 strong in your class. And, and we'd be, have a little rope in the middle and going back and forth. But I could tell when somebody wasn't pulling. And that's the way it has to be in this particular miracle. Everybody was getting instructions concerning what they need to do. This was a, a, a miracle that was going to concern the group. That's why I'm also glad this is the last miracle we're going to be talking about. Verse 11, it says, This beginning the miracles of Jesus in Canaan of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples did what? They believed on him. If you ain't never heard nothing out of these four lessons I done taught on miracles, this is the one thing that every last one of these people that received miracles had. They believed on, you're never going to see a miracle from God if you don't believe him. It just did not happen. If you believe it, you can receive it. That's why I don't ever let nobody tell me I, can, I could be 80 years old. You still ain't going to tell me what I can't do. You cannot even entertain people telling you what you can't do. Because the very second they start telling you what you can't do it and you even entertain it, they, they're starting to tear down your belief system. I preached on that before, your belief system. Oh, man, it came. He ain't going to never be. What? Who told me? God, God ain't tell me that. I mean, it's the devil's job to tell you what you can't do. That's his job, and he does a good job at doing it. If I had a dollar for every time somebody told me what I wasn't going to do, I'd be a millionaire. I believe in my heart there's been a million people in one way. I just had somebody last week talk, laughing because I recorded a song cause I, called I Believe God. And they, oh, I can't believe you singing all this. Stuff. Man, God gave me my instructions. My instructions didn't come from you. I don't do stuff to be seen and known of men. I do stuff 
Like this Bible just says, the beginning of miracles did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples. Well, I do stuff for the glory of God. I just put on Facebook recently that uh, my, my workout stuff, even though I didn't choose to start it, but because it started and I got into it, it's for the longevity of my life with Christ and my children. So I could be here as long as I possibly can and instruct them in the way they should go. You know, it started out not necessarily the way I wanted to start it out, but once I got into it, that's why I love God. He's so infinite in his wisdom. Because once you start walking with God by faith, you don't see nothing. Like blind Bartimaeus, he didn't see nothing. He just heard that Jesus was coming. He said, who was that? that? That's Jesus. What? He started screaming. That's all he had to hear. It was a rap. He started crying out. And that's how I am. When I hear an opportunity for me to come up by faith, it starts out with a simple cry out. I can do it. You see somebody else doing something that you believe God want to use you to do, you start building up your faith in Jesus Christ. I can do it. God can use me to do that. I heard Frank Hammond say he went to a, a studio of some secular artists, and they had all these nice uh, boards and stuff and all this nice stuff in the studio. And he walked in there, and he was like, wow. He said, God, let me do this for you. That's how quick you can start believing God for your miracle. You know, when, when uh, uh, I talk about it quite often, my son was a little boy. First thing I bought him was a basketball court because I felt like God told me so strongly as we talking right now that he was going to be a basketball player. So that's it. That's all I had to know. That's it. I ain't got to deal with nothing, no other sports, no soccer, no football. And people are like, well, I don't hear from God like that. That's your fault. I tell parents all the time, if you got a child and you believe in God, and see, this is, this is where the problem is, and you believe in God to do something with your child, you need to start seeking God concerning your child. You should spend some kind of time with God saying, God, why did you allow this kid to come from me? How can I glorify you with this child? That's what you need to know. That's, to me as a Christian, that's something that me and his Christian mom need to know. And once God told me that, because they got to go through school, and they're not going to be just going to school, holding the Bible, speaking in tongues, walking through the hallways, they're going to play sports. They're going to do things to glorify God. So when God let me know that, that was it. And I got seven kids, so believe me, God gave me word concerning all my kids, and I stayed in God's face. I cried out until I got specific instructions on what my kids was going to do. So I wouldn't be out here all willy-nilly just throwing them in everything, trying this and trying that. I had specific instructions. We serve a God of order. The Bible is also known as basic instructions before leaving the earth. The Bible is known as that. So if the Bible is basic instructions before leaving the earth, how many miracles are written in the Bible? You have to follow the instructions. You know, a lot of times we hear people say, well, just do what the Bible says. Well, that's a vague statement. Just do what the Bible The Bible says a lot of stuff. Everything you will receive and, and, and by way of changing your life will come by way of instructions. Everything. There's not one thing you're going to experience in this life that ain't going to involve instructions. Not one single solitary thing. Everything is going to come with instructions. How to drive cars, how to uh, get your license, how to you get a new job. They're going to teach you how to clock in. Everything. Think about it. We don't think about this stuff until God brings it to light. He illuminates the word. He brings it to light. Everything we, we, we do. And you may even think you know how to do something. But because we serve a God that's all-knowing, he will show you things. One definition of instruction is direction or order. Directions or order. So God will always give you direction. He's trying to give somebody direction right now as to how they're going to receive their miracle. Direction or order. And we know, because the scripture said, at the beginning of miracles in verse 11, the beginning of miracles did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him, Glory means praise and honor. God's going to work his miracle through you or with you for his glory. It has very little to do with you because God can use anybody to do what he wants to do. He can use anybody. He can use anything. That's why we need to keep ourselves humble before God. He will exalt you in your season. And we all get frustrated. We, we talked about that. A couple weeks ago concerning the, uh, the one with the issue of blood for 12 long years, we all get frustrated, and we want stuff to happen when we want it to happen. We want to get married right now. We want to get the job right now. We don't, this little kids right now like, man, I can play. No, good boy, you can't play in the NBA. You're too little. You can't play in the NFL. You ain't big enough. There is a, there is a season and a time for you to, you to get to where God has for you to go. So what are we doing in the, in, in the middle, in, the, in between time? We're following instructions. 
You know how many people who didn't make it, why they didn't make it? They didn't follow instructions. Well, I dreamed one day, I would, well, what happened? Well, you know, I, um, you didn't follow instructions. And it's a sad case. I talk to some of my old dudes all the time on the internet because they be seeing, you know, stuff with my sons and all my kids. Oh, man, so your kid's doing good. I say, yeah, man, just think how close we could have we could have made it. We would have had somebody, you know, guiding us. And like, hey, man, don't go to that party. Don't do this. Don't, don't mess with that girl. I mean, a little bit of instructions would have saved us from, 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 from so much drama and allowing us to receive our dreams. Now, it's not too late for certain, your miracles. Some things just ain't going to happen. That's just reality of the fact. You can believe till you blew in the face. You ain't going to be no 80-year-old dude in the NBA or NFL playing no ball. That's just all it's to it. But I'm saying this for the young people as well and the old people. There are some things that you will receive or you will not receive because you're not following instructions. And one thing I try and share with young people all the time. I mean, I was over at the barbershop talking to some dudes. They wouldn't even let me out. They was all young dudes. And they man, come back anytime. Because they was heeding the words that God was speaking to me concerning their lives and their future because I got a few years on them. And I was like, look, man. If I would have known this back then, if I would have did this, and I would have done that. Now, my life ain't not nearly over. But there are things that I'm just not going to be to do anymore because of where I'm at in my life. But I tell these young kids, I'm like, look, man, who told you you couldn't do this or to do that? If you follow these few instructions, and I knew God was speaking to me because they don't even go, they're not even churchgoers. And they wouldn't even let me out of the room because they was just like, oh, man, this dude is killing me with this, with this wisdom and with this knowledge that God has allowed him to experience through his life. I was giving them cast direction. They didn't even know why they was there. So do a little reverse real quick. Some of the key points. Mother of Jesus said they had no wine. In verse 3, they had no wine. In some cases, you might not even have no faith. The centurion officer on March the 9th when I preached on him, he didn't have no, he, all he was was a centurion soldier. His job was to go be at his post. And at his post or in his locker room, he was hearing about this man named Jesus who was doing these things and was coming, was crossing all these crowds that he wrote. He was hearing this stuff. And he's like, okay, I hear that we Romans and that we don't get down with the Christians, but just, just what if this man Jesus is who he says he is and can do what he said he can do? Just, just what if? Have we ever thought to think that he might be who he said he is? I mean, he's done everything he said he's going to do. So I believe this centurion soldier in himself, when his, when his servant got sick and they gave him medicine and took him to physicians, that's like, oh, I don't care if I'm a centurion soldier. I'm going to go approach, I'm going to go beseech this man and say, hey, you know. So that was a key point. They had no wine. Philippians 4 and 6 says, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known unto God. You can come to God, and I preached on all throughout this, but you got to come correct. God, I want a miracle because it don't work that way. You already ain't getting nothing. You know, I done told my kids, my wife, anybody in the ministry, you can come to me about anything in the whole wide world. It's how you come at me is, is what kind of results you're going to get. The way. You come with your chest stuck out. Well, Dad, I believe, well, psh, you believe what you want to believe. You ain't getting nothing. I done hear ex-wives come at me. Uh, uh, hold on. Take that bass out your voice. Come on now, you know. Yeah, and, and I got young sons. They be with their little, little girls, and I be seeing them talk to them stupid. I'm like, that, that chick better get it. She better get a revelation. You come correct, you know, you got an ear. You at least get an ear if you come correct. If you come stupid, the wall comes up quick. Bang out. <laughs> huh? You say something? That's the way it is. You can't just step to Jesus any way you want to. And if you're a man or God or a woman or God and you have standards, I'm the same way. To, you know, I'm not quick to anger, but at the same time, I don't, I don't deal with foolishness. You got to come to God correct. Like I said, the, the centurion soldier came beseeching. Jairus came worshiping. The one with the issue blood came pressing. Blind Bartimaeus came, he cried out. He couldn't, he couldn't find him. He'd be pity patting all over the place. It was probably crowds. He probably get kicked. He cried out. So you have to, he says, but be careful for nothing but in everything in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request made. Verse 5, do what Jesus says to do. How did this become such a hard thing for us? If I tell you to pass the ball to Jalen and let Jalen shoot the ball, that's what we do. And we go on and win the state one day. 
But no, you take the shot. Now I look at everybody crying and mad and all upset. High school, it's follow the instructions, dude. That's how important it is to follow instructions. It's so, I mean, I, 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 I preached this earlier that how it was that my mom, she said, look, I get off work at 5 o'clock. I want the floor, I want the trash checking out, floor swept, and the floor mopped before I get home. Okay, I'm a kid. Yeah, right. That's going to happen. So I'm running around goofing off, la, 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 goofing off, goofing off, 4.30. Like, oh, shoot. Back on it. So I'm in a rush now. So I just go, go grab uh, some water. Kids don't do this. I go grab some water, put it in the cup, throw it on the floor, grab the mop, swap the mop. I'm like, cool, cool. I'm like, oh, shoot, trash. Run back over the wet floor, grab the trash, run back over the wet floor, run take trash out. I'm like, I'm cool. Like, oh, she come in the house. She look at the floor. Footprints on the floor means the floor ain't been dry, so you just did it. She look on the sides of the room and see dirt pushed up. Hold on, you ain't even sweep the floor. That's how God is with us. Why do we think we can fool God? Now, if our moms can figure out stuff like that just by being CSI and looking around, you know God who's, who, who's, who knows all the hairs on your head, and we want a miracle for him. That's why I said come correct. Just come correct. 1 Samuel 15, 22, 20, 1 Samuel 15, 22 says, To obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. We shared that scripture earlier. Obedience. A lot of times, God knows what you're capable of doing. Matter of fact, the Bible says he will not put on you more than you can bear. He knows what you can do. He's asking you to do something for your obedience. I know, I know, I know he, what he's capable of doing and what he's not capable of doing. I know how much faith he has to do it. I just want to see if he's going to listen to me. That's his test. That's his only test to receive his miracle, if he's going to follow my instructions. You know how many people probably missed out on blessings because they was two minutes late, half an hour late, a day late, or they didn't turn something in, or they didn't do this, or didn't fill that out, didn't cross that T, didn't dot that I. Well, uh, you would have got 100 on this test, but because you forgot to do this, I can't accept it. What? That's stupid. I just spent hours taking this test, and just because, hey, the instructions was, you know, I don't even want to know the, the biggest thing a person in the history done lost because they didn't follow instructions other than their life. There's some people that done flat out died because they didn't follow instructions. And we know that to be truth because some people text.